Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. This is Esther Lambert, uh, Research Associate with the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. I just want to welcome you all to this month's Friday Forum dedicated to a discussion around research into extreme weather to inspire risk reduction guidance by way of strengthening structures. This is important for both the insurance industry and homeowners. So we're very happy to have you all join from different sectors to this discussion. Just to ensure that everything runs smoothly today, I'd like to inform you of a few logistical and housekeeping details. So there will be a half an hour question and answer period following the presentation. So please get your questions ready and uh, we welcome you to add them to the question and answer chat box that's designated for this. And if you have any technical questions not related to the actual presentation, just put them into the general chat box. Uh, and so just to remind you, the slides for, and recording for this presentation will be available on the ICLR website, as well as the ICLR YouTube channel, ICLR Info. Uh, so at this point, again, I just want to extend a warm welcome, welcome to you all and also to our special presenter, Dr. Anne Cope. Uh, the Chief Engineer at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, IBHS, uh, where she leads the development of research programs to inform climate resilience of structures, improving their performance in the face of such hazards as hurricanes, wildfires, thunderstorms, and hailstorms. Dr. Cope also has worked with Reynolds, Smith and Hills Inc. designing projects for NASA, Department of Defense and commercial launch operations. So I just pass over to Dr. Cope now to enlighten us um, on these topics. Sure, thank you so much, Esther, um, for the warm introduction. So um, I'm joining you today from the IBHS Research Center uh, here in South Carolina and uh, want to provide you with a little bit of information about what we do and uh, how you can get that information. So um, IBHS is, um, is very similar in many ways to um, the Institute for Cat Catastrophic Loss Reduction, um, where, where ICLR focuses on, on the Canadian insurance market. We focus on the U.S. insurance market, and we share um, information and work together as partners in the the future of, of resilience and, and share information. So a lot of the stuff you'll see um, here today is, is work and stuff that we have collaborated on with uh, partners at uh, ICLR and University of Western Ontario, now, now just Western. Um, so you'll see common threads, um, but you'll see some things that are specific uh, here to the US. And uh, so let's get started. So this is a video to show you where I am today. Um, Christine is going to click on that one to uh, make it play. And uh, here we are. So um, this, is, this is the facility where I'm sitting right now in uh, South Carolina. It's uh, on a large 90-acre uh, parcel that's in the middle of rural South Carolina because we have that big fan tower. <laughs> so we use a lot of power and make a lot of noise. And uh, that's why we're out here in a little bit of a rural environment. Um, where we can be loud and, and messy and do big science. That's uh, 105 individual fans. Each fan is uh, 350 horsepower. Um, and so it takes about the same amount of energy as a small town of about eight or 9,000 single family homes. This is showing you um, our back area with the smaller labs and an overview of the whole facility. The test chamber itself is as tall as a seven story building. And we have an uh, area out there in front where we have, um, you saw some roofs out there in the yard. Um, so we have an area where we're aging and weathering different roofs so that we can take a look at what they are. Um, so that's our facility by which we do the big science. And, and this is the why behind why we do the big science. Uh, we can't prevent all the damage, but we can absolutely um, bend down the curve and prevent the things that are avoidable. So um, what I've got here on the screen behind me, this is the path of the tornado that hit, one of the tornadoes that hit Moore, Oklahoma. And um, there in the middle of the screen, you see just a, a path of, of utter devastation. You know, that, that's probably one of the areas that got the tornado its EF5 rating. That's not 
where I'm going first in terms of, you know, what's the low hanging fruit in order to, to change um, people's lives. Let's look down here closer to where I'm sitting at some of these roofs that are right down in this area. That's avoidable loss. That's stuff that we can do something about. Um, those are pieces and parts where we can, with small incremental costs to changes in building codes and test standards, we can have um, better quality construction that can absolutely eliminate a lot of the pieces. If we took out a big eraser and eliminated all of the EF0 and EF1 damage um, that occurs in communities like this one, that can have an enormous impact on our homes, our businesses, our communities um, throughout North America. So this is the why. Um, that we use to propel our um, passion for building science and engineering. So we do work here in the laboratory and we look at uh, field occurrences and match up what we see. We've got, um, you know, in the pictures that are scrolling behind me, these are mostly from Hurricane Michael. That was a design level event that hit the coast of Florida. And I'm gonna go back and go through that one one more time, to the cascade of damage. It starts with the roof. We see roof cover loss, and that leads to additional damage. Once the roof cover is, is lost, we also see, I'm gonna go back to that one one more time, see if it will advance properly. There we go. Roof cover loss, the initiation of damage. Next after that, we see wall cladding losses, next level of damage. Then we see entire roofs or pieces of roofs that then come unhinged to the point where we get to total collapse. So we can take that information from the field, observing it in post-disaster and replicate it here in the lab to figure out what do we go after first? How do we group different things to recommend changes to both the codes and the standards? And how do we recommend best practices? Not just hurricanes though. Um, this is a great picture from a recently occurring tornado uh, this is a picture from Chattanooga, Tennessee, but I'm sure you could find um, just as many pictures like it um, from Canada, from, you know, you guys have just as many tornadic events um, that result in this type of damage that we see here in the United States. The picture of the yellow building in the test chamber is from the garage door um, study. So look, same thing, garage door fails, wall pops out. Um, we see this time and again, and um, going to the next piece, this is why the garage door matters. So we, we're taking the science, we're, we're looking, okay, we know our why, we want to affect homes, businesses, and the larger community. We can see the incremental damage, roofs, walls, pieces, dig gigantic pieces of roofs all the way to collapse. Now let's dig in deeper and say exactly why. Was it the garage door? We think so in that particular picture that I showed you just then, because those post damage investigations are showing us that if the garage door stands strong in the face of a wind event and does not fail, the likelihood of you having huge structural problems or the roof popping off is much, much, much lower. So, aha, you know, here we go. Here's one piece that is a replaceable piece of a house. So it can be a retrofit. It's also something that we can um, target for codes and standards, and make sure that people are getting the right information. Stickers. So um, here we label our doors with stickers. And this was not, in the American codes, it was not required until we got this into the code just in the last cycle. And starting this January 1st, garage doors are now required to have a permanent label by which you can tell what they have been wind tested to. Um, so, you know, we use the English units that they're gonna have PSF, pounds per square foot, um, but this will show you, the sticker on the door will show you whether the garage door has been tested um, and whether it is a wind rated garage door. Ironically, when we started this project, it was very difficult for us to actually procure a wind rated garage door um, here in the state of South Carolina, we could not get a door that met the current building code without making a special order. 
Um, so we worked together with the Door and Access System Manufacturers Association, got this piece into the building code. It was their proposed idea to say, yes, we need permanent labels. Here's how we're going to do it. And we got it into the code for this um, cycle, and now it is required. So if somebody does not have a sticker on their door, if they don't know whether their door is wind rated or not, our recommendation to them is that that needs to be one of the number one things on their list for upgrading or retrofitting their home. It's a great investment um, where wind is a problem, which is most of the United States and a good portion of Canada. Um, so we recommend you get a new door and that you understand what that wind rating is. We take the information that we um, investigate, both from those post disaster investigations, as well as from the laboratory. These are pictures from the laboratory here in uh, South Carolina. We take that information and critical to us here in the United States, we have put that into voluntary beyond code standards. Um, so one of the things I, I'm often a little envious of, of our Northern um, neighbors is that uh, Canada has great building codes and great um, compliance adoption and administration of those building codes. We do not have the same thing here in the United States. There are 17 of the 50 United States that have statewide adopted and enforced building codes. The remaining states leave the choice to adopt and enforce or administer building codes up to the local jurisdictions within the state. So you get a very different patchwork association of, of which areas are going to adopt and enforce a code and which are not, which is why the fortified standard that IBHS puts forward is such a critical thing for our members because fortified, they can, it's the same across any of the states, no matter what the state is adopting or enforcing or not adopting or not enforcing, <clears throat> the fortified program provides a level of resilience that, that can be categorized and taken across those, those boundaries and those borders. So we put our information, our scientific information into those standards and tiers, first, second, and third, good, better and best so that people can build to that standard even when there's an area where there's not a code adopted or enforced. Turning now from wind to hail. <clears throat> so here um, in the United States, um, insured losses for hail are a $10 billion a year problem. And I know, um, I know that that's a big problem in Canada as well. Um, I think the Calgary, we've been talking with, um, with people about uh, opportunities in the city of Calgary to really take a look at, at hail losses and to mitigate those losses by, by taking action. Um, and so we've done um, several years worth of work on hail to try to figure out exactly what's going on um, because hail is really interesting and unique. It's, it's not the same as the ice that you get out of your refrigerator or you know, the ice maker in your refrigerator freezer. Um, hail can be much less dense than that. It can be large or small or varied in shape. And so um, we have done um, several years of study to really quantify the existing um, naturally occurring hail and to then build a test protocol for asphalt shingles, which are the primary roof cover um, that we have experienced being replaced because of hail damage. So this is what it currently looks like um, if you do the UL2218 test method, which uh, Underbrouders Laboratories had created several years ago. You drop a two inch steel ball onto a panel that has been created for the test. And you drop the steel ball twice in the same place. And then you take a look at that asphalt shingle um, you specifically take a look at the back only of the asphalt shingle to decide whether it has passed the test or not. So that is the, was the current methodology before we got started on our test program. And we took a pathway of evaluating that test standard to see how it was performing versus naturally occurring damage. We realized very quickly that, huh, um, steel as a steel ball 
is very much like hitting an asphalt shingle with a hammer. And it doesn't look at all like the type of damage that we see in a real environment where hail is striking roofs. So next we, we went through the literature and tried to figure out, okay, well, who's written what on a naturally occurring hail? There was a lot of work done in the 70s, specific to crops. Some great information about hail and its impact on crops uh, that was done in the 1970s. And while that was great information, it wasn't enough. So we um, put together a program, went out in the field and did a whole bunch of measurements on naturally occurring hailstones, categorizing them and measuring them so that, that we could then recreate those realistic hailstones in a laboratory environment and test roofing products against those types of hailstones to get a realistic damage and then evaluate the performance of the materials. Lengthy pathway, it took us several years to get this done, um, but it's been great information. <clears throat> because we have not only the kinetic energy that we can measure in the field by hitting this device, um, this, this device uh, that's on the screen there is kind of like a, it's like a wee drum set, you know, and so when you hit it, um, it knows how big and how, how much energy the hail is hitting it with. We also measure the hail to get the correct mass, to get the strength, how, how hard it is, how, how much force it takes to crack the hail. And using that information, we were able to then make hail in the laboratory that met those specifications. We shoot the hail and you have to shoot it so that it, when it hits, it's hitting at its correct terminal velocity. And when it hits, it can do one of a, a couple of things. So this is a hailstone bouncing off a roof. And at first glance, you might think, well, the steel ball did that. Um, yes the steel ball does bounce right off the roof, and yet it doesn't hit with the same impact momentum because the damage picture that's also on the screen shows you how many granules have been scrubbed off by a, an actually realistic hailstone hitting an asphalt shingle. It does not look like a hammer strike. So hail will bounce. Hail will also shatter, um, and that can that can be pretty devastating to some of those granules on top of the asphalt shingle as well. And the last thing that sometimes we see is that hail will, will, will shatter and leave a slush. That, uh, that's, that's just a unique um, pattern of the way the hail impacts asphalt shingles. So we shoot the hail and then we take a look at the damage. We categorize three different types of damage. So when I described the steel ball test just a little bit ago, you take the steel ball, you hit the shingle twice, and then you look at the back of the shingle. Our evaluation methods are always looking at the top of the shingle, and we look for three different things. We look for tears, we look for dents, and we look for loss of granules. Now the, the picture for the loss of granules, depending upon the size of the screen that you're viewing this, um, you, you may have trouble um, but what I'll tell you about that is that there are pock marks of black asphalt showing through that picture where individual granules have been torn off. And what will happen to that shingle is um, the granules are there to protect the asphalt from the sun's ultraviolet rays. So when you have something like, like this picture right here where some of the granules are missing, the sun's gonna bake through there and bake that asphalt underneath and age that shingle prematurely and it will eventually uh, suffer. So tears, dents, and granule loss. We're looking at all three pieces and we are rating the shingles that are on the market that are saying that they, that they have purported that they have an impact rating because they've done the UL 2218 test. So of the shingles that we have tested so far, um, the Atlas shingle that you can see there on the, on the list the Atlas shingle has a, an excellent rating, overall excellent rating, and you can see how it performs against dents, tears, and granule loss. Um, we also have um, Owens Corning and CertainTeed and Malarkey products and IKO products, another GAF product, all of which are getting a good rating, that second green color, good rating because they have um, good performance in dents or tears or granule loss. We get one or two that are marginal with dents, but they're still keeping their tears from happening and they're still keeping the granules on. So all of those are getting good marks overall. 
And then right now we have a Tamco product and an Owens Corning product that have an overall marginal rating because they just don't perform as well for dense, um, for, for either dense or tears or, or granulosis, whichever category it is, they, they don't perform as well. And so they don't get that good rating. I mentioned before the IBHS has the voluntary fortified standard. We also have for hail, fortified hail, fortified high wind and hail. And if you're gonna have the hail piece on there, you need to have a shingle that is in the good or excellent category um, because we can see how well they perform versus the other shingles. Now, the really good news about this list right here is that this is the updated list. When we first put the test protocol out and tested the shingles, we had a, couple, we had a shingle that was red. It got a poor rating, even though it passed the UL 2218 steel ball test. When we tested it against realistic hail, it got a red uh, poor rating. And that shingle was pulled off the market. Um, it was actually pulled off the market immediately as we released the test. And uh, the shingle manufacturer called us and said, we're not gonna make that anymore. We've, we're not making it. Can you please take it off the list? And we said, oh, we'd be more than happy to take it off the list when it's not on the shelf and, and available for purchase. We'll be more than happy to take it off the list. We'll keep calling the suppliers to make sure that um, when it's off the shelf that uh, we'll take it off the list. And they said, oh, okay. Uh, apparently they recalled the product and, and got it off the shelf. And we were able to confirm that and took it off the list. So this has been a great tool um, by which we can provide a performance evaluation for products um, and, and shape and change and make the marketplace um, appreciate the products that are performing better and get those on the market. There's a product, the Owens Corning product that is number two on the list, uh, is a brand new product that um, the R&D occurred on that product because we were doing this testing method, because we were doing this new idea. Um, Owens Corning developed a new product and it has done well. So um, it's a good news story in terms of shaping the marketplace and providing that information to the shingle manufacturers. What is it that people are looking for? Um, how can we provide um, the right information for people who want to mitigate this risk? So turning then, we talked about wind, we've talked about hail a bit. Um, I wanna talk about wildfire um, and then we'll have time for the, uh, the Q and A. So we do wildfire research here and have collaborated many times um, with our friends at, at ICLR over post-disaster events and, and what should we recommend and what are the best practices. Some of the work that we do here and as we take a look at the wildfire peril, we know that, that wildfire has, is a triangle. The, the movement and spread of uh, wildfire through the wildland urban interface is, is absolutely affected by the weather, um, the dryness, the winds, the, the speed is affected by that weather. It's affected by the topography, upslope, downslope, you know, channeling of, of the winds through the topography. We absolutely know that. And, and those are two things that exist. You can choose where to build. You can, can't really choose your weather. I mean, you can move to a different location, but, but the weather and the topography come hand in hand with where you choose to build. The one thing that we can absolutely recommend that people um, have some sort of measure of control over are the fuels that are available to burn. So we focus our information on that and focus our research. Sadly, we are seeing communities um, make mistakes or repeat mistakes. Rebuilding the exact same way in a place that has already burned and expecting a different result is um, frustrating. And so we, we want to get our information out there to get ahead of the peril and to um, provide more resilient communities for people to, to have their homes and businesses. We know um, that those broadening areas, the first five feet, five to 30 feet, 30 to 100 feet, we've got some great wildfire guidance um, that's available on our website and the ICLR website. It shows you what to do in these areas. But what we have is typically in a suburban area, within that second zone, you're already in your neighbor's living room. Um, so you only might have control over the first five feet. And then you need a community to pull together to look at five to 30, 30 to 100, 
it's not just the individual homeowner. It's a group pulling together to do resilience. We found some of the critical pieces. We've studied them here. Dual pane, the windows, keeping that heat out. The mulch landscaping and, and items that you choose to put within the first um, five feet. Again, I use the English units. Um, so we describe them as the zero to five foot home ignition zone. And, and we've demonstrated that here in the lab, the clear difference between a home that has great mitigation and a home that has terrible um, choices made. And we see that um, post-disaster, you can watch what, what burns and what doesn't burn. Fences and other things that are right up against the house and can propagate the damage right to the structure. Um, this one is, you know, this is lucky. Somebody knocked down that fence before it took off even further. Um, and so that home in the picture survived. Vents um, and allowing the ember to come into the attic. Um, that's a picture, the picture with the, the things that looks a little bit like fireworks. Um, that's a time-lapse picture from inside an attic in our test facility. So we've generated the embers. The embers are attacking the structure the same way that they would be doing in a real event, wind-borne embers. And uh, we can sit in the attic and watch the embers come in. Um, now, if it's my attic, there's a bunch of stuff up there, like, you know, wrapping paper and that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's just fuel for those embers to light and then burn the house from the inside out. Decks. Everybody loves to be outside and loves to use their decks. Um, we've done some interesting work that shows right now, um, particularly in California, there's, there's a lot of study about the walking surface of the deck. But our work has actually described that the walking surface of the deck is not the critical point for wildfire resilience. The understructure of the deck can actually be much more important to keeping the fire from propagating to the building. So we've got a roadmap for um, suburban wildfire adaptation, which shows what you got to do to start. Um, then once you get that first tier of information going, how do you then pivot um, to do the next pieces? And then what can you do for those larger projects to level up and to really make a significant impact to the vulnerability of an individual structure um, and the overall community? So we've got the start here, we've got the keep it going, level up and the last mile. The start here includes you gotta have a fire rated roof covering. Um, you gotta take care of that home ignition zone and you need to clear out all the stuff that's underneath your deck that can burn and light your deck on fire. Um, you need to also replace or cover those vents to keep all those sparklers out of your attic and out of your wrapping paper. And this video is going to show, um, this is a cool video because it shows, in, in, uh, once I start the clicker, you'll watch the seconds tick by and you can see the big difference between the home that has the wood siding has made many choices that we would say are not resilient. Combustible siding, combustible mulch, uh, plants right next to the house within that first five feet. And um, so there are many things about that home that are less resilient. The gray one, there's, there's nothing combustible within the first five feet. They were exposed to the same amount of attacking embers. And this is what happens once those embers get a foothold. Literally seconds have gone by. The corner is now uh, lit. The wall is burning. And in just a matter of less than a minute, it's going to be up into the attic. You can also see it down underneath that deck. Um, so the mulch under the deck in front of the house is burning. And at this point, it's up and into the the side and into the vent and penetrating up into the attic. It's amazing to me how quickly it goes from, oh, there's a couple embers and I may have lost that one juniper bush to my firefighter friends would call this fully involved. And um, now it's a raging house fire. It, it's always fascinating to me how quickly it goes from one to the other. We stopped this test um, in just a few more seconds. Yeah, and, and we stopped the test a few more seconds after this video uh, ended because we were, it was penetrating the test building up into the attic and, and it was about to you know, tear that part up. 
we needed to use the test building again. <laughs> so we had our fire crew come in and, and put that out. We were able to uh, reskin the building and use it again. But it's amazing to me just how quickly this can take place and um, how something that seems small, like uh, making sure there's nothing combustible in that first five feet can have such a huge difference on the resilience of a structure. Now, that gray building was ugly. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> With you know having rocks right and absolutely no landscaping is tough for people to stomach. Um, so this is a project we put together. Um, we had some help from some landscape architects to say, how do you make it pretty? Because that gray building, boy, that was nasty. I don't want a building that looks like that. I don't want to live there. Um, so this is a, I'm going to click it right now. This is a building that we would say, ooh, you've got some issues. You have things that are within that home ignition zone, within those first five feet. You have pine straw and other things that are all over the roof. You need to clean that up. There's too much going on here. This, you've got vulnerabilities. What does it look like if we change those, but do it in an aesthetically pleasing way? Um, you can use hardscape instead of instead of combustible things. You can use succulents instead of that juniper bush, which the firefighters like to call green gas cans. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be ugly. It can still be beautiful and resilient at the same time. So real quick, back to the other one, a little more woodsy looking, but there's some things that need to get cleaned up there. There's some bushes right next to the house. Use of hardscapes, use of succulents, still have your outdoor living space. You can still have it and it can still be beautiful. Um, so these are some of the messages that uh, we are working to get across and, and working to make available on our, on our website. And as mentioned before, it really is a full system. So if, if I had an individual house that looked like that last one with the beautiful purple flowers and succulents, and yet my next door neighbor had the, the tinder box that's in this picture that's burning away, I would still have a lot of vulnerability if I was 10 to 15 feet away from that structure. So the homeowner has to pay attention to their own home, but then the community and the partners in the community have to work together also for the fuels that are in the larger community. Because we've got fuel, we've got weather, we've got topography working together as a triangle. And the one thing that we can really control are the fuels. So we've, we've pulled those pieces and, and information together. Um, this just gives you a, a link to see, you know, what does it look like when it's on the IBHS website? Um, we've got fortified, fortified specific locations. We've got research. We've got information available specific for homeowners, research that the insurers can then use to pass along to homeowners. Um, and we have public facing information for media, for people, for, you know, my Aunt Linda, who's a trauma nurse in um, Birmingham, Alabama, she's never had to buy a roof, but if she has to buy a roof, I can point her to this information and say, Aunt Linda, this is the information that you need to ask your roofing contractor before you buy a roof, because that's probably going to be the largest investment that she's going to make in that house. Um, and she wants to be well equipped to make those choices and make that investment. So this gives you the information about who we are, um, what we're doing down here in South Carolina, out in a little bit of a rural area where we can make a lot of noise and tear up buildings. We're looking at wind, wind-driven rain, hail, and wildfire. And we get that message out to, uh, to other people. We work hand-in-hand -hand with our partners at uh, ICLR and at Western. And uh, I'm happy to answer any additional questions that you might have about the work we do and the partnerships that we have. Thank you so much, Dr. Cope. That was very uh, informative and very interactive. I particularly liked the house um, model demonstrations. Very informative. And we have a few questions here um, just to start off the discussion. The first couple of questions related to the garage door research that you've um, pointed to in the presentation. So the first one, the question is um, asking approximately what increased price did you see when getting a rated garage door compared to doors that failed to comply? Okay, and, and um, the, the feed is just a, a little bit difficult for me. So the, the question was, what is the price difference between the compliant doors and the non-compliant doors? I, I believe that was a question. So 
when we first started that research um, here in the state of South Carolina, I mentioned to you that I couldn't get a door without it being a special order. So at that time, the price difference was like, I was paying a significant percentage more to get a wind rated door than I was just an entry level normal door. But what I am seeing and am, am happy to see is that now that it's required to have the sticker on the door, we expect that now building code officials are going to start checking the sticker. Now it's going to be common that you have to carry the wind rated door because that's code compliant. Now it's going to be common that you're going to be able to just order this door. And so we're going to see the prices come more in line with, I should be able to just walk into the store and buy a door that's compliant with the code, as opposed to having a special order um, for that product. So I can't give you a specific answer right now because I'm seeing the market change. But um, in areas where entry level doors have been commonplace, I would expect the price to increase um, marginally for a while until it settles out. Um, but I don't have a good answer for the exactness of the cost. Thank you for that. Uh, we also have another one on, on garage doors. So can you hear me a bit clearly now? Can you hear me? Um, I, I can hear you, Esther, but there, there is an echo. I'm so sorry. Okay, I, I'm going to try to speak slower so maybe you can catch the gist of what I'm saying. So, um, you know, the garage doors were a critical element of wind risk reduction. So have, they made, have you made similar findings for wildland urban interface fire? Christina, I'm sorry, now I, can, I cannot hear Esther, um, but if you put the Q&A back up on the screen, Christina, I can answer. So I think the question was, do I publish wildfire risk for various geogra geographies, and do we get much pushback from the public um, when we do? Um, so I'll, I'll answer that question first, and then we can uh, maybe go to another one. So yes, we do publish um, for different geographies, because the the native plants and, and whatnot in um, Western regions are a little bit different than in the Great Plains regions. Um, right now we have guidance. Um, so we, we don't have um, regulations, we have guidance. Um, so we don't get much pushback on the guidance. Now, right now in um, the United States, particularly in the state of California, there's a lot of discussion going on. Um, there are a lot of stakeholders at play that are talking about, well, what, what should be done? What, what should be done from a public policy standpoint? Um, what should be codified? What, what should we do here? And there's a lot of heated discussion about what could or should take place. Um, so there's a lot of push back and forth there. The interesting position for um, groups like ours, like, I mean, IBHS, we are providing the science. And so there's very little pushback when we provide, well, here's, here's what we see about decks, here's what we see about windows, here's what we see about that. Um, so there's not much pushback on the science itself, though there are a lot of people trying to figure out what should be regulated and what should be in the public policy. Thank you for that, Dr. Cope. I'm just hoping that you can hear me a little bit better right now. I can hear you better now, Esther, okay. yeah. Great. So the, the question I, I was trying to get at to that was related to garage doors um, was, um, have you found made any similar findings for wildlife, wildland urban interface fire? So we know that garage doors were a critical element of wind risk reduction. So have you made any similar findings for wildland urban interface fire? So I got the part about garage doors being critical for wind, and there was a tie to wildland urban interface fires yes. uh, for garage doors. So um, interestingly enough, I have not seen that, that tie. Um, as I'm thinking about, you know, garage doors critical for wind, absolutely, because they are such a large vulnerable opening on the home and can allow the wind to come up in and press on the roof. Um, and the pieces of the garage door that, that change to make it a wind rated and compliant door are the, the strength of the door itself, its rigidity, and the connections that it has to the, the wall. So that makes it stronger from a wind perspective, which 
wouldn't necessarily tie in for the fire perspective because it's all about embers getting in or embers uh, catching the cladding on fire. The, the doors are typically metal. Um, I think some of them are, are plastic, but they're such a large surface and usually on top of a non-combustible surface like the driveway that we don't find them to be a critical piece in the wildfire puzzle. Okay, thank you. And um, what features of the garage door design changed to become compliant? That was a follow-up question, I believe. Sure. So the, the pieces that make a garage door wind compliant um, include the rigidity of the door itself, how strong the panels are, and then the connection from the door in, to the wall that it's not gonna get popped off its hinges and, and fly away. So there's really two mm -hmm. aspects to it, the rigidity of the door and the connection to the wall. And, and for example, if, if you walk out to your own garage right now and kind of push on the door, you can get a sense of how flexible the panels are. Um, but a really good thing for you to do is take a look at the wall. Um, if you see like a good number of connectors on one side, but only like two on the other side, um, chances are you need to get somebody out there to come and take a look at it. Yes, that does make sense. Um, I have another question here um, related to the granule loss. So granule loss will cause asphalt shingles to age more quickly. Does granule loss always trigger replacement of roof cover? Example for insured loss claim. So that's an excellent question. Um, no, I don't. So granule loss doesn't automatically trigger. Oh, got to replace it. Well, and as as any in industry, um, right? So there are individual insurers out there making different decisions about when to replace and when not to replace, or when to go out and and get somebody out there to take a look, and when to just say, oh yes, this is a claim that happened in this area. We're just going to pay it without investigating it. Lots of different business decisions going on there, and each insurer is going to do that in their own individual way. But in terms of um, scientists and engineers evaluating damage, when I have granule loss, I'm like, okay, well, how much granule loss? Um, is there a patch that's, is, is this one or two places on the entire roof? Okay, well then I need to keep a watch on it. Um, and what's underneath that? Is it gonna penetrate through? Probably not. Um, but if I have a widespread area over a good big section of the roof where, oh gosh, you know, I can see the size of the hailstone all through this roof. Well, sure. Um, you know that roof is going to deteriorate. And plus, it looks terrible. It looks like a spotted dog. And so um, the homeowner is going to want to have it replaced because it looks like it's been pummeled by hail. So there's all kinds of different pieces and parts going on there. What I want to mention, though, about the granule loss is that it's not just that it's ugly. I mean, you're gonna get the request from the homeowner to replace it because it does look ugly, um, looks spotted, but there is also damage going on there because the granules are keeping the UV out of the asphalt. And so what we're seeing in the hail test protocol is that shingles that are doing really well against granule loss are gonna have a much more durable, much longer life than those that are not. Thank you, you've answered a couple of questions there in that response, so thank you for that. Um, also, um, you've mentioned that um, IBHS has had success at identifying a poor performing IR shingle, and the shingle was pulled from the market. Um, are there other ways there, your work has directly impacted building product quality? Oh yeah, so um, so yeah, we're really excited about the way the work has impacted the um, IR shingle market, and we're excited. Um, this was a joint project between IBHS and Western, where we investigated vinyl siding. So vinyl siding is a very common um, wall cladding uh, in North America. And the test procedure for how do you wind rate the vinyl siding was, a little bit lacking in our opinion. Um, there were some pressure box tests done, which I won't get into the science of that, but we did testing here in this big laboratory to, to put vinyl siding to the test as it would be in a real windstorm. And because of those measurements, we were like, yeah, the way you're testing it is incomplete. And this value within that test standard needs to come way up. We explain that to the Vinyl Siding Institute 
and boom, within the next cycle for the testing of that building product, they changed it um, by, they doubled the factor so that the wind rating of the vinyl siding is now much better than it was before. That's a great success story um, for the impact on vinyl siding and, and that will trickle quietly and behind the scenes through the marketplace. The other thing that we're doing uh, collaboratively with Western is because of that vinyl siding project, now we're looking at anything with it, the air can get behind it. Um, and there's a great dissertation that has, come, that has just come out of Western taking all types of air permeable products and realizing that there's really one governing theory of how the air gets behind them and what you can expect in terms of the air pressurization of those types of products. We're gonna take that information and move it forward into the building codes. Um, here in the United States, that's the American Society of Civil Engineers document. Um, and Dr. Greg Kopp and I both work on that committee. So we're gonna take that information and we're gonna update those test standards and they will get into the marketplace as well. Um, so it's, there's a couple of success stories, um, one of which is easy to point to with the shingles, one of which is a little bit less easy to point to because it's behind the scenes with vinyl siding. And there will be more to come as we get more pieces and parts into the codes and standards. Right, right, thank you. And as we're on the topic of the shingles still, <laughs> I've heard um, one of our, our, our one of the, our guests here is asking about asphalt shingles again, um, that I expect it to last 40 years instead of the typical 20 to 25, due to the use of fiberglass backing. Have you done any research on those types of shingles? Um, so I think the question was a um, 30 year shingle or a 40 year shingle. I think it was related to the number of years that you see on the manufacturer's warranty for this shingle. And, um, you know, the, the number of years that the, the manufacturers list on, on the shingles, that is a great marketing tool. Um, it, and, and I know it has been used in business practice um, in, in terms of replacing like kind and quality, the number of years um, that are on the shingle. But what I can tell you from having studied shingles um, against wind, against hail and against fire is that um, the, the number of years that are listed there on the package or in the warranty um, should not be counted on as a, yeah, it's gonna last, if it's a 40 year shingle, you're gonna be replacing it in year 41. Those numbers are, they can be indicators in terms of the quality and thickness and whatnot of the shingle, but they should not be considered the engineering lifespan of that product. Um, actually, a shingle manufacturer provided this great analogy to me. He said, you go get two refrigerators from the, from the, the store. You go to the refrigerator, you ask them for a store. You ask them for the, the you go to the store, ask them for a refrigerator. He said, this one comes with a 10 year warranty. And this one comes with a five-year warranty. They both come from the same factory. Are they different? And I kind of looked at him funny and, and he goes, no, they're not different. They're both the same refrigerator. Or the refrigerator is made in the same way. It has metal, it has a condenser, it has these products. The warranty doesn't change how the manufacturer built the refrigerator, but it absolutely changes the contract with which the manufacturer will do things or replace things for the consumer. And, and that's the same for roofing products. The, the number of years is, is a warranty thing and it's a contract between the manufacturer and the owner. It's, it's not the engineering life of the product. Thank you. And we're actually going back a bit to hailstones now, the research on hailstones. Um, Regarding that, uh, hailstones often have knobs and um, are rotating as opposed to what appears to be spherical models. How could this affect the results? Oh, thanks for the question. So yes, hail does often have knobs or spikes or other weird looking things on it. Um, and people love to take pictures of those hailstones because they look really cool. Um, what we found though, in our years of going out into the field and taking pictures of hailstones and measuring hailstones and categorizing hailstones is that approximately 80% or so of the hailstones that we've encountered doing that field research are 
spheroid, right? They're, they're round-ish, um, not perfectly round, maybe a little bit elliptical or what like that, but, but round-ish and not knob-ish. And so um, we have confidence that by doing the spherical hail test method, we are getting the bulk of what's going on and that we can have a follow-on research to look at the impact or effect of knobs and spiky and unusual hail, um, but that it would be a little bit outside the norm and not the typical amount of hail that's falling and hitting roofs. Thank you, that's great. Um, so we're gonna, gonna go back a couple um, little while to get back on wildland urban interface. Um, could you elaborate a bit on how the understructure of the deck contributes to the wildland urban interface fire vulnerability? Oh, sure. Happy to describe that here. And, um, and if somebody wants more detailed or written information about that, you can go to our website and find those suburban uh, wildfire adaptation, and, and it will have detailed information there. But the, the gist of it, is that um, when we do the testing and attack with, with embers or with burning brands or you know, however it is that we're gonna ignite or attack the deck, what we have seen is that the propagation of the deck to the house is dependent upon the joists that run underneath the walking surface. So if the walking surface, the joists underneath are carrying the fire to the house. And so if those joists are uh, highly combustible, they're gonna carry. If those joists are steel or you know, non-combustible, then the walking surface may burn, but it'll just sit there, burn char, and just sit right there. The joist underneath um, will not propagate it to the structure. That, is we're like, oh, aha, that's an interesting and unique finding um, that we've now incorporated into those um, suburban wildfire roadmaps. Okay, and also um, with respect to the vent protection, uh, do you find that the installers uh, know how to protect vents from embers um, and all that products are readily available? Yes, um, so there are some products out there that are readily available. The easiest answer, though, is to make sure that the mesh size, um, so um, vents usually have some sort of um, mesh grid screen to keep stuff out, right? Bugs, rain, mm -hmm. embers. And so the finer or smaller the mesh size for that screen, the better the vent will protect against embers getting through. Um, and vents that do well against wind-driven rain also do well against wind-borne embers. So there are some types of vents and whatnot that have gotten the approval rating from um, Miami-Dade. So Florida has, a, Florida has a standard by which you have to test your vents for water intrusion. People who have gotten a good rating there and an approval on vents that prevent water intrusion, those also prevent ember intrusion. So there's definitely products on the market. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we're getting more and more information out there about the critical pieces for wildfire resiliency, we, we anticipate more and more products will become available. Uh, also one of our attendees is very happy to know that um, you're working with landscape architects um, to identify more peeling options, that's great. Um, are landscape architects finding that homeowners are becoming interested in fire smart? landscaping practices? Well, you know, I think um, right now I would say that's probably a little bit of a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that um, in areas like, like the state of California, where um, it, it's, it's being publicly reported that insurance availability is a difficult and public policy pressing question. So in areas like that, where homeowners, insurers, regulators, every piece of the stakeholder community is talking about how to mitigate the risk so that we can get back to a healthy market. 
people are highly interested. Um, but like right now in Colorado or in other places where they certainly a high risk, um, but there hasn't been as much recent activity and as much political discussion, the, the appetite is much lower. Um, so I think it's a matter of timing and um, marketing and um, trying to figure out when to reach the consumer about this critical area. Um, and we'll see what we end up with. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, the next question I actually have is more, I guess it, you could say it's more political in nature. So in the US you mentioned um, and some of the states, a lot of the states, there's been a slow uptake, you know, ad adopting or implementing building codes and standards. Um, in your experience, what would you say maybe is some of the major factors behind this um, that some states have not um, implemented some of those building codes or stand standards or are slow to doing so? Um, it, is that one in the chat? Because I, I couldn't quite make out the audio. Oh, this one is not in the chat. Um, can you hear okay. me a little bit better now? I, I'll give it another try, Esther. I'm sorry, there's, there's a okay, little bit of um, an echo. We'll give it another go. Earlier on in the presentation, um, you did mention about some of the US states um, not implementing um, or uptaking the building codes and standards. Yes. Um, so I'm just wondering if in your experience, you have any idea what some of these reasons could be for that? Oh, so what is the reason that some of the states don't um, take up the building code? Yes, it's, it's a very American thing. So I'm, go <laughs> I'm glad that many of you don't have to worry about it. But um, we have several states. Uh, Texas, for example, is a great example. Um, Texas, the Lone Star State, has been hit by 27 landfalling hurricanes, and they do not have a statewide building code. Um, it, it's they are firm believers in the idea that the local jurisdiction is going to know what's best for the local jurisdiction. And so um, they have a recommendation about which code that, that the local jurisdiction should adopt, but it's completely up to that local jurisdiction whether to adopt or not. So for example, the city of Houston has a building code. There are several cities along the um, coast that have building codes, but the unincorporated county area right outside the city of Houston, no building code. So if I was to build an apartment building in the county right outside of the city of Houston, the only, um, the only permit or a, you know, government piece of information that I would have to have before occupancy of that apartment building is a piece of paper from the fire marshal and that's it. Well, that's really, that's really good to know. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. I'm just wondering, our attendees, these are all the questions that they've posed. I'm wondering whether you, Dr. Cope, you have any closing remarks or final thoughts that you want to share on the topic? Oh, thank you for asking me that. Um, I have really appreciated the opportunity to share some of the information um, about IBHS with you. I encourage everyone on the webinar to go and take a look at the publicly facing information. And, um, you know, if you have any more questions or whatnot, just shoot us an email or reach out to um, our partners because we've been invited to come and present information to you because we work with ICLR all the time. Um, so Dan and I have conversations all the time. If you send an email to them, it'll get to us and we'll work together on the answer. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to say hi to you. Um, and I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. And I'm sure everyone will agree that it was really excellent. The response is very informative. Thank you so much. I just also want to remind attendees that the next um, Friday forum will be on May 21st and we'll be discussing emerging financial aspects of climate change and also talk about climate disclosure, finance and litigation. So we really look forward to having everybody again. Um, and Dr. Cope, special thanks to you for your presentation today.